Um, welcome to week two of the NOFA Summer Conference. Um, my name is Paul Bertler, your host for tonight. I'm a NOFA Mass volunteer, board member, and uh, operations coordinator for the Summer Conference. And you are attending the Incorporating Foliar Feeding on Your Farm workshop with Nathan Harmon. I have a couple, um, couple introductions and uh, reminders to go over before we get started. I'll, I'll keep them brief. Uh, we have a number of sponsors who help make our conference possible, and I encourage you to purchase from them whenever possible. Uh, if you do purchase from them, uh, let them know that we, you appreciate their support of NOFA Mass um, and all the NOFAs. We couldn't do our work without our sponsors. But I would also like to thank you, our viewers and listeners, especially those of you who are NOFA members. Uh, we rely on our membership to keep our organization healthy and strong, and we appreciate your support in helping us do our education and advocacy work. We are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Great, well, thanks for listening to my introduction, and now uh, my distinguished guests. It's my pleasure to introduce Nathan Harmon. He's coming to us tonight from Southern Indiana, um, but he consults with Advancing Eco Agriculture, um, super excited to hear what he has to say tonight. So Nathan, thanks for taking the time. It's all yours. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and I trust everyone can hear me all right. Okay, excellent. Um, well, hello. Good to be here. Wish we could be together in person, but um, I appreciate you uh, reaching out digitally to to learn more about foliar feeding on your farm. Um, it's not the most exciting of topics. Uh, <laughs> also, because it can be enormously technical, depending on equipment, which is really what it's, uh, what it's all about. Um, I'm going to breeze through some parts, and um, I think that the most uh, productive thing for a lot of us might actually be the questions and answers so that I can really direct things towards your needs. So feel free, um, put the uh, comments in the chat, which actually I don't think that I have up right now. Um, or Paul, please feel free to, uh, to, to butt in and let me know. Um, otherwise, unmute yourselves and ask a question. If I know that it's going to be handled right then and there, then I will probably just keep talking and answer your question when I come to it. If I know that I'm not going to cover it otherwise, I will jump right on it when I see it. As Paul said, I've worked for Advancing Eco Agriculture for about six years now. I've worked on primarily fruit and vegetable crops, also broad acre crops and livestock farms and done uh, international work on uh, just all kinds of plants, all kinds of plants and have found that they are more similar than different. And through sap analysis and a lot of in-depth soil analysis and really working hand in hand with a big number of farmers, we have been able to really get, I think, a pretty solid handle on what works from a foliar feeding perspective. It's um, not, was not part of, of my life really before working with AEA, I'd done a few foliars here and there with maybe some fish or seaweed because I thought that would be good, I heard somewhere, but really not with any technical basis or understanding. And it can be one of the more powerful uh, techniques to, to incorporate. So I think that's enough. We will dive right in. Uh, here in the next hour or so, I, I hope to go over the following topics, basically a little bit of background and some light science, um, some some goals that you should be able to uh, address with foliars, and then get into really the the uh, a few principles and a few specifics on uh, equipment and action. So let's go. Why would you foliar feed? It could be a lot of hype. It could be some new uh, promotional ad campaign. It could be a waste of time and money. There's certainly a lot of information out there that would suggest so. Um, 
so why should we bother? Well, it's because plant health is really important and we have to have excellent fertility if we're going to raise crops that are capable of supporting us in, in great health. Um, we have to be able to prevent diseases and insects through what we consider organic and natural and regenerative means. And I, I believe that the technique of application is less important than the, the impact of that application on, um, on all fronts. So um, if, if we want to have truly healthy plants, this is one way that we can help. And you know, the other primary way is through the soil, but soil is just enormously difficult. <laughs> it's, there's so much going on. Uh, it's a biogeochemical ecosystem, right? And, and things rarely go exactly as planned when you drop them into an ecosystem. Leaves, also a miracle of nature, but a little simpler. So, um, so hopefully it takes out some of the guesswork. Uh, foliar feeding is highly specific. Um, again, you're, you're dealing with uh, the amount of space covering a leaf on an acre of ground instead of the multiple millions of pounds of rock mineral and living things in, in that acre of ground. Uh, so you, you get an opportunity to, to zero in in time and place. Uh, and there are a lot of unique opportunities there. And then, you know, most importantly, because foliar is not, it's not an end all be all, nor is it just a stopgap or a band aid. It's part of a system of managing plants and farms. And when done well with the right goals, uh, not pesticidally, but actually trying to build soil and build, uh, build the life in the soil, then foliar feeding can allow plants to take up more nitrogen, to take up more carbon, to deposit that in the soil, to actually build soil more effectively than we could if we weren't trying to maximize the health of those plants. Uh, do you spray? Uh, is a common question at farmers markets across the country and the customer usually wants to hear the answer no. Uh, I believe that the, the better question is what do you spray? And that we really need to get over from our perspective as farmers and with consumers to, uh, to realize that just because this technology was invented with a very specific purpose, which was nefarious and has been abused, uh, does not mean that we can't really take it to do wonderful things. So, um, we've known that plants can, can take up nutrients through the leaves for a long time. Um, in, the, in the 1950s at Michigan State University, uh, Drs. Tukey and Witwer published some of the first papers in Western um, science using radioactive isotopes. And we're really able to just like Geiger counter and watch nutrients move up and down a plant. That and the work taken off from that is how we've learned so much about the mobility of various nutrients, what moves where, how fast. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really, really fun stuff. You know, potassium can be applied at the top of a plant and sent down through the roots, out of the roots and into the soil, and then back into the plant and back up top in, in hours. Uh, you know, um, each photosynthetic cycle of a day is, is just all about sending things up and down. And um, they observed up to 90% efficiency as far as the amount of various fertilizer compounds applied and taken in compared to as little as five and 10% efficiency in the soil. So um, that was, that was a, a, a pretty big deal. And you know, at that time, they noticed specifically that phosphorus and zinc and iron um, brought much greater benefits being applied as a foliar than from uh, a soil applied. Um, we've learned a lot more since then, but we know it works. And the reason it works is because of stoma. Um, there, there are a few other ways that nutrients might get into a plant, but 
primarily the stoma are the openings in a leaf. Uh, the word actually means like a mouth. So the hole is the stoma. Um, the, uh, the cells around the stoma are called the guard cells and they actually do the work of opening and closing. And, you know, a, a light bit of, of chemistry here having to do with potassium ions uh, drawing water in and out of the cell to change the pressure. And um, th the point is that, you know, at a moment's notice, a plant can choose whether or not to have the stoma open or closed, right? So it is really making decisions about what to let in, what to let out, and when. Um, stoma, like everything in nature, are crazy diverse. Every plant has its own size and shape, has different architecture, uh, is, you know, for all we know, looking for different nutrients, looking for different opportunities, um, cooperating with different microbial species. There are uh, just, I don't even know what these plants are. Um, I don't know that we have this kind of mapping for the stoma of all of our crop plants. Um, but some things we do know is that dicots, uh, dicotyledons, have more stoma on the bottom of their leaf than the top. So most of your broad leaves and a lot of vegetable crops are, um, they have more stoma underneath than on top. They have a greater ability to take in and let out. Uh, monocots are really pretty even on both surfaces of the leaf and that makes sense. You know, onions or uh, wheat, corn, you know, they stand up straight. Both sides of the leaf have pretty even access. There would be no reason to, to have stoma on one side or the other. Um, floating leaves like a, like a lily pad only have stoma on the top because that's the only place they're going to exchange with the air. Uh, sunken leaves usually don't have stoma and do this other ways. Most trees exclusively have stoma on the bottom side. And I think that's really fascinating because when you think about, you know, if it's been dry and you feel a storm coming and the air starts to get a little moist, that tree will just turn all of its leaves upside down. I've seen this so many times, right? They, they just they just flip right around hoping for that, I think, first flush of foliar feeding, right? They're trying to, to get access to that rain that's about to come. Um, so the, the size varies. The, the slit along a stoma might be anywhere from 10 to 80 microns across. So pretty big variation. Um, the space across this way might be anywhere from a couple to uh, 50 microns or micrometers. And those mesh sizes really are, are the same as the microns that you might use for uh, screening fertilizers, right? So if you're screening down to 50, uh, 50 microns, then everything that goes through should generally be able to go directly into a into a plant stoma. Um, and does it work that way? Well, yes, totally it does. They, they not only have relationships with minerals and, uh, and the solid particulate um, that happen to land there, but they have lots of relationships with various kinds of bacteria. Now, a few of these are actually E. coli in, in lettuce leaves and are a good demonstration of why that sort of infection is so hard to control in, in leafy greens where, where some bacteria con congregate. But also you can see um, this is a tomato plant over here with um, what we assume are, are beneficial, you know, two or three different kinds of, of fungal and bacterial spores uh, that the plant is keeping out of its stoma but keeping nearby. Uh, this is plant growth promoting bacteria um, at the stoma of an uh, Arabidopsis plant. And I looked for a lot more of this, but of course, um, these things aren't really studied, uh, except from a toxicological point of view for the most part. But as you can see, yes, um, <laughs> living things can, can dip in and out. And I think this is a fascinating realm of study that I hope people take up. Um, so... Most pesticides and herbicides are from 0.01 to 10 microns, um, which explains how systemic pesticides are easily able to enter the plant and move throughout it. Uh, most bacteria are from 0.3 to 60 microns, so only the very biggest ones would, would ever have any trouble, but most are, are easily able to get right through. 
Um, something like a sugar crystal is about 400 microns, probably not going to make it, but when you dissolve it, um, those, those carbohydrates can. Powdered sugar is 50 microns and could. Um, coronavirus is about 0.5. Sorry, 0 0.05. So, you know, you could get a whole army in in a gulp. Um, so, Dr. Dr. Tukey's quote was, the leaf is a beautiful mechanism for absorption. And I think we're learning that so are the roots in all kinds of ways that we never knew. Even uh, stems and woody tissue, we're, we're seeing nutrient and living things moving through. Um, you know, plants can't move. So they're going to find a way to get access to whatever they can, wherever they can. And it happens to be that the leaves work. Okay, you all believe me there. And they've been doing it since the beginning from rain and fog and ocean mists and anytime an animal pees on it or a bird poops on it um, basically you know <laughs> wherever uh wherever the opportunity is ripe there is a guaranteeably you know enough stoma on that plant to open up and take it in um couple of of what i think are really beautiful um little video clips that bring some things together so We'll, we'll watch these. Even in the driest places on Earth, a cubic meter of air contains a... Can you hear that? Yeah. Million, million, billion water molecules. But H2O can't form droplets on its own, ever. Much like the plants they nourish, raindrops grow from seeds. At the heart of every raindrop is a tiny impurity. Anything from specks of dust to salt, pollen, even chemicals. Rain seeds give water molecules something to cling to so they can grow into droplets. Trillions of these droplets make up every cloud we see. And when they eventually get big enough and heavy enough, they fall. So that's rain. It's water collecting on little islands of floating sky junk and pixie dust. But why do some places get so much rain and others get so little? Because not every place on Earth has the same type or the same number of rain seeds in the sky. And that takes us back to the Amazon and all that green stuff. 95% of the Amazon's rain seeds are made by the trees and plants that live there. Along with water vapor, trees in the Amazon release chemicals that act as super sticky H2O magnets. These biogenic, volatile, organic compounds are how the forest makes its own rain. The air over the Amazon contains just 300 particles per cubic centimeter, making it some of the cleanest air on Earth. It's likely that a couple hundred years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, most of Earth's air was that clean. But these days, thanks to pollution, even our cleanest air elsewhere has 2,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And while you might think more particles equals more rain, that extra stuff in the sky spreads the same amount of water across more seeds. And smaller droplets means fewer fall as rain. If you live in the U.S., whether it's in Big Sky, Montana, or crowded L.A., there's probably less rain now than there was a few hundred years ago, just because of that extra stuff in the air. What's super cool is when trees need rain, they release different amounts of these rain-attracting chemicals, seeding more of their own clouds and rain. All right. Uh, a bit elementary explanation, but I love it. Um, I... I, I that concept that not only do plants accept foliar nutrients, but they emit foliar nutrients or rain seeds um, is uh, it's not directly relevant, but I think it it really pushes forth, you know, why we can why we can bring this technology to a, a level of fruition um, that we probably don't even know about yet. Dust storms can be pretty amazing when you see them from space. And sometimes they're huge. You know, I had seen little dust storms blowing and you kind of look hard. This, you didn't need to look hard. It was the continent of Northern Africa, basically obscured by thick brown dust. And as I orbited, I couldn't wait to come back. And when I did, I saw that dust storm that was over Africa, now over the Atlantic Ocean. In my next orbit, I see it hitting the coast of South America.
every year about 27 million tons of that African dust we can see from orbit drops out of the sky into the Amazon basin. And it turns out it's the perfect fertilizer. All right. So, uh, fascinating stuff. It gives me a whole new perspective on dust storms. It makes me feel like, eh, maybe it's okay that these things are blowing around um, across the earth. It, it's all going somewhere. But it also gives me a new, a new perspective on rain. Um, you know, why, why do plants respond so much better to rain than they do to uh, hose water or to irrigation water? Well, it's because every drop of rain is uh, encapsulating some piece of nutrient soil or bacteria or salt or mineral from somewhere else. Um, that's, I believe, uh, a, a massive part of how plants have always needed to grow is foliar feeding from pieces of stuff coming from afar through the rain. So, cool. Now, what can we do with a with a foliar? Uh, what are the actual problems that we can handle? Because certainly, um, we, we we can't do them all, right? <laughs> it's 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 not going to fix everything. It's not a total solution. Um, you know, we're not going to get all of the uh, calcium needed to adjust a 50% base saturation calcium soil um, through through the leaves. We're still going to use dry mineral fertilizers, uh, compost, and manures where appropriate, which is, uh, is is still a lot. We will be able to reduce those applications, we will be able to use them more uh, appropriately and conservatively and specifically because with another tool in the box, um, you know, not everything is uh, is a nail when you're holding the, the hammer. So um, variability is one of the big ones that I see as being useful for a foliar. You know, soil conditions are always, always different in, uh, from one side of the field to the other, even one side of the greenhouse to the other. And uh, depending on the equipment and how proactive you are about it, you can really zero in on uh, specific issues where you see, um, you know, the, the insect uh, population starting from from eggs usually on on weak plants you know you can go to that area and catch it beforehand um, you can go to a place that got flooded out and was thus weakened and you know give it something that the rest of the field really doesn't need you know you don't have to apply everything everywhere all the time and foliar gives us a nice option to do that um, and we you know we don't know what's going to come in the season uh, you know that's that's why we need the kind of flexibility to not apply you know, two tons of this and 750 pounds of that and 40 pounds of this and then hope for the best. We can actually um, adapt as the season throws wrenches. And also we can get specific and flexible um, variety by variety. You know, you plant out two kinds of uh, green beans and one of them is has small leaves and it's necrotic and it's getting insect attacks and you can do something about that variety right next to the other one um, in, a, in a really comprehensive quick way. Um, efficiency it's it's just the name of the game and you know it, it could save money. I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying that switching to heavily foliar feeding your crops is going to be um, necessarily cheaper, but it is more uh, efficient, and not wasting inputs is certainly uh, less expensive than wasting them. And the uh, yeah, the accuracy and and specificity that we can employ um, is is a big deal. But you know, most important really for me if I'm honest, it's just the environmental aspect of mining less. Um, you know, copper is great for plants in small amounts. And if I can get the needed amount by applying four grams of copper as opposed to 12 pounds, 
then that's less copper that was mined and transported and processed and uh, it's less copper that I had to deposit on my soil. Um, and, you know, we, we know that Mm, phosphorus and nitrogen applications are causing eutrophication of, of waterways and you know we have to curtail that so getting the right amount at the right time um, is really important you know cobalt is a, is a precious metal basically that's mined in Africa under crazy conditions um, uh, similar to you know blood diamonds and it's remarkable what a tiny amount can do. So I want to use the smallest amount of any of these things to get the, the most good. Um, another problem that foliar can, can solve is the lack of solubility of certain nutrients that are only available when they're soluble. Um, you know, agriculture was steered down the wrong direction for a good 50 years by assuming that everything had to be soluble. Uh, it's, it's still commonly held that nutrients have to be <laughs> dissolvable in water in order to be taken up into a plant. It's not true. However, for a lot of things like phosphorus, nitrate, potassium, you know, uh, calcium and boron certainly move much better um, when, when they are solubilized in water. And the moment that our soils dry up enough that those things are no longer moving, um, we, we've got nothing unless we can provide a foliar, which can really, it's not going to solve a, a drought, but it can absolutely be a, a sturdy crutch to keep plants going um, and experience a lot less stress um, and, and get something like drought tolerance um, to, to overcome the lack of solubility of uh, inadequate soil moisture. Um, pH and EH are, are a, a very big deal and we're not going to get very far into it. Um, except to say what I think y you probably already know, which is that nutrients need to be in specific forms to be taken up by either microbes or plants. Uh, microbes can help to, to get them into uh, reduced forms, but the soil is so complicated and there's so many rock minerals binding with each other uh, that a lot of oxidation states are, um, are, are not correct. Like iron and manganese are probably the, the two most common. Um, if you have any kind of alkaline soil, then it's very likely that the majority of your iron and manganese is, is unavailable. Molybdenum is actually the opposite and performs better in a alkaline soil. There's uh, a lot going on there. The, the simple answer is have perfect soil health because all those microbes will just take care of everything for you and keep it available and cycling in the soil. The thing that doesn't work is to take a soil that's not cycling completely and throw a bunch of minerals out there. Even if they were in the, the right form when you applied them, they will be quickly overcome. And so using a... Uh, either a product or even a homemade solution that is in the correct oxidation state and is available, direct uptake is, is the goal. That's, that's why we can use such vastly smaller quantities. Also, uh, you know, progress. Foliars are not about solving every problem all at once. They're about making progress towards the, the kinds of uh, soil and farm conditions that, that we want to grow our food in. And, you know, I've, I've worked with growers who have had access and applied 30 tons of compost per acre for years, and they don't need to fully your feed. <laughs> um, but most of us do not have that kind of access, and most of us are not growing in really ideal soils. And uh, the, the, the best way to grow soil is to do it in place using the, the cycle of plants, which is the only way that soil is made in the first place. So using foliars to always be maximizing essentially photosynthesis, you know, that's really our goal. Uh, if we're, if we're lacking in photosynthesis, that's the easiest thing to take care of and it will make everything else better. Um, so yeah. We, uh, we, we have iterative progress. Now, on efficiency, uh, just one quick example 
zinc is a good one because uh, zinc is commonly used in in both conventional and organic agriculture. Its its roles are pretty well understood, and it's available despite its oxidation state, or rather, it only has one oxidation state in the soil, so it's not as fussy as all these other minerals. So it's a good example in that context. Um, you know, a common rate for uh, a dry zinc sulfate organic mineral application on a low soil test might be up to 25 pounds per acre, probably not a lot higher than that, 30 pounds might be down at five and 10 pounds per acre, kind of depends on if somebody's doing it yearly or once every two or three years, depends on where they are with things. That may provide, should provide a decent zinc response. And basically that's going to end up as 8.75 total pounds of actual zinc on, on the soil. And will probably need to be repeated in a year or two. If we instead, used a foliar 3% zinc product at four quarts per acre. Uh, in the case of, you know, the, the products I know best with advancing eco-agriculture, our zinc is 9.2 pounds per gallon. And 3% of that is 0.276 pounds, right? So a quarter pound compared to eight and three quarter pounds. And I would expect a stronger, like a good bit stronger zinc response. That's um, that's on the higher rate of what I would expect to see per acre per year on most farms. Um, so, you know, a, a solid example there. It's going to be um, a, a different way of looking, but even more stark for some of the things that are used in the tiniest rates, like molybdenum, which is almost impossible to get spread across an acre in a, in, in a dry mineral blend uh, without I think there was some lightning and a little flash of electricity. Hopefully my internet holds on. Um, uh, it might be impossible to even get that spread out there, right? So uh, the, the the particle size of, of applying in liquid is, is also really key. You know, it, even with 25 pounds of dry zinc sulfate uh, ground very small, you're only going to have one speck of zinc dust every 12 feet not accessible to every plant um and then you know what about what about toxins when we when we think about spreading uh spreading materials that way this is actually an example that i went through with with julie rawson um when her certifier um kind of brought up a complaint on the arsenic content of one of the foliar inoculants that, that we were using. And so I just looked up a, uh, an example of a parts per million in, in compost that one of my customers had used, five parts per million. That's neither high nor low. I believe the, the number that the certifier had to keep us under was 20 parts per million was the allowable arsenic to be applied. Um, but you know that <laughs> when you do the math, one ton of of compost at five parts per million uh, amounts to one thousand <laughs> times more actual arsenic being applied than the seven point two ounces total that we were going to apply in a season, and that was in five or six different applications in in very very small amounts. Um, now. We all have a lot to learn about what happens when you apply these things direct to the leaves rather than broadcast in the soil. Um, you know, does it does the plant also take them up more readily? Does the plant uh, shunt them out um, and they wind up in the soil anyway? Um, you know, there are legitimate concerns here, but the the blunt fact of the matter is that you know we can by being more efficient with our materials, we also reduce the amount of toxins that we bring onto our land, which are unavoidable in most organic nutrients. Um, and yes, all right. So uh, some, some principles of application. Basically, you're always looking for the strongest effect with the least effort and the least material. You're looking for where can I really jump in 
at a at a wedge point and tip things the direction I want to go. Um, you're looking for the the effect that always photosynthesis, always and ever photosynthesis, unless for whatever reason you have a very unique crop that you need to reduce photosynthesis on. Uh, like maybe you are uh, blanching endive, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, both for all the other parameters of nutrient gathering and in in the plant and crop itself, and the effect on the on the bulk soil, um, we are looking for that biggest effect. So we're always looking at, at photosynthetic nutrients like magnesium and nitrogen and phosphorus and molybdenum and manganese. Um, and then we want to really get down to on your farm, what's the biggest possible problem that we can solve with with foliars? Like where's the, the best place to jump in? You know, there's no reason to do it just because, but you know, what's what's really a pressing issue that hasn't been solved else elsewise. Um, and then, you know, the the opportunity of experimentation is great because you can get down to a single plant level. You can go out with a single spritz bottle of a single material that you're a little curious about and see right next to each other within a few days time. Um, you know, some, you, you, don't, you don't have to have the kind of, you know, two year sophisticated ultra measured soil studies that science is used to because you can just go hit one plant and look at it. <laughs> That's an amazing opportunity. Um, so the, the, the principle in the, in the short span of time uh, on, on daily and weekly and monthly applications is basically you always wanna be looking for early and late applications. Um, that is for multiple reasons. For one thing, we need the stoma to be able to take these materials in as liquids. They drink up water droplets um, and, and we need to, to allow these materials uh, to remain liquid. Uh, similarly, you don't want them to be immediately washed off. However, the majority of foliar uptake will have happened within a couple of hours. Um, you know, if, if conditions are right, Plants have had the option to, to take it or leave it by that time. And the majority of foliar uptake, um, not to say that uh, things can't be re-wetted the next day uh, if they dry on the leaf and then you get some morning dew. Um, you know, we, we, we don't know all of this, but as far as um, radioactive isotopes and bricks readings, we know that the majority of foliar feeding happens very quickly. So that's a great relief. And uh, I like to, uh, to always feed as often as possible in as small an amount as possible. You know, if you know that you need three quarts, I would much rather see it going out in three one quart applications than one three quart application. However, that has everything to do with your labor and your time and the actual <laughs> uh, viability of such a thing. I will say that it pays unless that's expensive to do. <laughs> um, the uh the part of the reason also for those hours is we want to hit the plant when the xylem going up and the phloem going down are both equally open so that we're actually getting motion in the plant at night primarily plants are building proteins they are taking up minerals that they've uh, from from the soil and from down low and lower leaves and they're building new proteins at the top of the plant during the heat of the day, um, they are primarily making sugars through photosynthesis and sending them down. So our primary time to get a flow either way is, um, is kind of dusk and dawn and, and thereabouts. There are uh, specific readings, but they really do vary with elevation and latitude and plant type and uh, moisture conditions. So just shoot for dusk and dawn. All right, long-term timing throughout the course of the season, we want to be looking at the times with the greatest physiological need, when the plant is going through some major hormonal change, some sort of, uh, you know, stress is, um, uh, stress can be both internal and external 
and you know we we have to look at uh, assuming that you know a apple tree is going to go through all of these things and more in a single season and those are times when it will be switching from reproductive to vegetative energies and when it will have specific nutrient contents and when we have uh the, the largest opportunity to make a really big push and affect something rather than you know just in the middle of august when the apple is sizing you know it's it's getting a little bigger over time but it's it's you know th there are a few periods in the year where it's really just doing the same thing for three four weeks at a time we would hope to have that nutrition already in place but from you know uh, from a bud opening through cell division that three to four week period is just filled with really intense changes um and is is usually the largest deposition of micronutrients in in a plant um, a lot in the flowers will be used and lost and then a lot in the developing seeds will be deposited um, etc that's that's all a bit specific but um then you know the frequency is very much crop and gold dependent um you know i i, I have customers who absolutely feel they must have top quality uh medicinal quality plants with zero defects and they are sap, sap sampling weekly and changing their foliar program weekly and uh getting paid for it um and then i have customers who consider themselves lucky if they make one or two adjustments in a season only if something is hitting the fan there are different ways to do things um and do what you got to do um anytime you have a sap analysis or even a tissue analysis or even even a, a visual component of uh, of obvious need is a right time to address the the potential for a, a sap analysis but if you're planning the season you know for most farms i would say plan at least three sap analysis and three changes to your foliar timing to your foliar recipe um to in response you know we don't have to plan it out beforehand we can wait until we actually have data any kind of um physical damage where where leaves are are battered and open there are absolutely um you know that that's a time of of repair and materials like seaweed and manganese and um some of the micronutrient metals can really do a great deal to protect from infection right then it's uh it's partially foliar feeding it's partially uh um uh, you know an actual antimicrobial plus microbial <laughs> um it's it, it saved a lot of fields through very quick foliar feeding uh within hours after a, a serious weather event that's that's damaging plants like that can be the difference between a complete rebound and a full yield or uh, two days later um you know a, a field of mushy infected rotten plants um all right and then you know super important food safety regulations uh spotting staining you know what you do and do not want to wash it does not make sense to put a uh a foliar on leafy greens that you're going to have to be washing in in two days um you might want to be careful about your greenhouse tomatoes depending on your washing situation um you know but you should have no problem going out on a field of um you know wheat or uh potatoes at any point um if they if they need it then give it to them but you know you do have to consider food safety regulations and the the physical material that might be on your leaves i will note that we shouldn't have residues on our leaves if you have residues and you're doing a foliar your mix is probably too thick and you should thin it down with more water all right um should we focus on you know correcting specific deficiencies or uh, a lot all at once you know can, can you overdo it do you want to be messing with 14 ingredients or should you just use something the equivalent of miracle grow and give it the same thing all the time um you know how nerdy should we can you get well um 
<laughs> the results uh, match the effort and that effort can be too much <laughs> in some cases um, for, for practical farming. Um, I would say that it would not make sense to spray out a, um, you know, zinc sulfate or a single shot of potassium unless really you had good data that that was the only thing in any way lacking and that it was super critical to get it there now. Um, for the most part, when I read SAP tests, it's, it's typical to see in, you know, 95 plus percent of cases that we've got two or three minerals that are in excess, uh, several that are very low and a lot of them that are in between. And I would, I would look for um, always putting as much in one foliar spray as possible to correct as many issues as you can. If you don't have data, then you use your eyes and you use your soil report and you use uh, past crop history and experience. If you're organic certified, then some of those may not work and you're going to have to have an actual conversation to, to define what you can and cannot spray. Um, you know, there are some minerals like nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, manganese that are going to show up visually. You should be able to uh, take a photo or have your certifier actually look at and say, oh, yeah, that's that's nitrogen deficient. You should be able to apply some nitrogen right now. Or, you know, I see the purpling. That's phosphorus deficient. Um, then there are a lot of others like cobalt or moly or copper where you're not going to see a deficiency until it's basically resulting in actual insects and diseases and poor, uh, uh, you know, poor quality. And, um, you know, that's, there, there are no very easy answers here. Um, the, the split is really, are you organic certified or not? If you're not, then, um, I feel very comfortable using rational, tiny amounts of uh, a, a broad array of nutrients and, and giving it to them in, again, these, these rates that are a hundredth of what we were ever expecting to apply when organic regulations were put in place to protect us and our soils. Um, but if you are certified, then yeah, we need data and, and um, and that's the way it is. Um, so work from SAP and soil analysis. And, you know, the, the great thing is that it's not just avoiding paper, uh, you know, paperwork and, and satisfying regulations. It's, it's really helpful to actually have legitimate data that cuts out guesswork and you know what your, uh, what your plants need. Um, beyond that, you know, um, all the experimentation of, um, of adjusting uh, the, 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 the small plant samples where you can actually look at the response from one plant to another um, can tell you a great deal about what the plant needs. If you play, if you spray five different um, fertilizers on five different plants, two of them have a response and three of them don't then that tells you what two materials are, are going to be uh, actually having a, you know, a, a bricks response or a nutrient response or a color response in that crop right then. It takes a lot more effort, it's a lot more to keep track of. Um, I don't think that it would really fly in the case of a certification, but um, you know, if you're the kind of person turned on by that sort of hands-on research, then more power to you, it's beautiful. Um, so treat what you know you need, throw in a few other things that are safe and provide broad spectrum, very small amounts of, of uh, trace nutrition and biostimulants. Seaweed is still the standby of foliar feeding because it's safe and it almost always has a beneficial response. Uh, you know, fish fertilizers um, where, where usable um, for w without getting into food safety um, are almost always beneficial. Ocean water, desalinated ocean water products or mostly desalinated are almost always beneficial. That's because you're getting 
super trace amounts of, of all the fertility in the ocean um, and, and things that your soil almost certainly is not providing. Um, uh, compost teas and you know, EM1 or uh, foliar inoculants, um, those things almost always make sense. A little bit of molasses, sugar, carbohydrate, some little energy boost, both for the microbes on the surface of the leaf and for the plant itself, almost always makes sense. Now, you don't want to get into a situation where you're actually living on, on uh, sugar, but you know, um, a, a, a quarter pound per acre can make a pretty profound difference to the foliar uptake of the other ingredients. John Kempf calls these synergistic stacks multiple things that, that can go together in one foliar and always increase the results. Um, so obey the rules, test as often as you can, and don't waste your time with a single material. Um, so how do you put together a, an actual tank? Well, there is a good order and you really need to start with clean water. We'll get more into that. Um, fill your fill your tank, whatever size it is, up 75 to 90 percent with clean water. From there, if you're using pesticides, you would want them to be the most diluted and have the least impact on the materials that come after. So you don't want to put them in concentrated at the end. You want to put them into the largest volume of water up front. Um, if you're using microbial uh, pesticides, biopesticides that need to be living, um, that's a different story that comes uh, a little later. Um, then mineral fertility, that's all of your, you know, all of your nutrients, the nitrogens and potassiums and coppers. Um, and start with the most acidic material, read your labels, find out which materials are the, uh, the most acidic. And generally you want to start with those because they, uh, if your water is not in perfect shape, then those acids will be able to interact with some of the minerals and bicarbonates in the water source so that uh, you, are, you are doing less binding of the materials that come later. Um, then plant and microbial biostimulants like the kelp, fulvic, humic acid, molasses, um, those, those sorts of uh, general purpose background materials. Uh, and then inoculants and biopesticides, that's your, your living aspect. These might be in a dry powder, they might be liquid, they might be something you've brewed. Um, whatever they are, you're, you're going to want to put those in um, at the end with whatever technique is, is necessary for the, for the material. Um, dry powder inoculants, I highly recommend to, uh, to soak in water first and stir them up and, and, you know, set aside while you're filling the tank and then come back to them and really make sure they're completely stirred and, and dissolved and then pour through a strainer and into your tank. Um, if it's a, a liquid product, then, you know less less work um, just make sure that everything is in suspension and stirred up and uh, finally at the end a spreader sticker surfactant if using this really depends on, on what you're spraying um, AEA has basically taken care of all that um, our, ourselves we, we do not need to add spreader stickers and surfactants if you're getting into the process of picking and choosing multiple ingredients from uh, different sources, then you, you might find that you need to um, use one of one of these products to increase the the spread and stick on the leaves. Um, often, you know, vegetable oil, <laughs> put shortly, is a pretty good one in, in a lot of organic applications. Um, but there are a lot of products out there, and some of them have pretty pretty heavy results. Some of them are downright should be avoided because they have <laughs> more of an effect on plant chemistry than the things we're trying to put in. Uh, to be spread around. Um, and then, you know, uh, top off with the rest of your clean water. Now, while keeping all that in order, um, 
we should end up with a, a tank mix. If, if, if you've done that, you know, when you're, when you're trying a new recipe, you want to test it before you go out and spray it on the plants. Um, there's a pretty wide pH range. I would honestly say, you know, five to, to six, five is, is perfectly um, approachable to, to a plant. Again, keep in mind that most rain is, is acidic and plants love rain. They do want a slightly acidic foliar um, pH. The electrical conductivity, there are two different ways of measuring this, but they're the same number. Um, and the, the 3,800 or 3.8, something in that range, um, is, is less hot mix, less salty, less electrical conductivity. And that's what we want if we're going out, you know, frequently multiple times per week, um, once even up to once every two weeks, you want less EC because, you know, you're going to be topping it off shortly. Um, if the plants are only getting uh, a bare minimum, then you, you better give them what you can when you can. So it's going to be a hotter mix. That's just the way it is. They will deal with it. They will be thankful for it. But we don't want to always be applying, um, you know, 5,000 EC uh, mixes. So this is just a matter of having um, an EC meter and a pH meter and, and testing your tank mix. It's good practice. Um, and then when you've put in active microbials, you, you probably want to get those out of your tank in a hurry because they will start to use sugars and oxygen and uh, might not be living um, after, certainly after 24 hours, but even within four hours, they can start to wake up and, uh, you know, divide and form a biofilm and make life less good for you in your tank management. <laughs> Um, and then to whatever degree, maintain constant agitation. This is really equipment specific. If you have a backpack sprayer, you just shake it around while you're walking out to the field. If you have a, you know, 3000 gallon tank, then you're going to have, um, uh, agitation in there. Make sure and keep it on because many organic foliar materials are made of, uh, living or recently living things and rock materials. They are not soluble, clear, odorless, colorless um, uh, Kool-Aid, right? There are things that can settle out and that's a bad situation for your tank. Plus you want those minerals. You want those minerals to be evenly distributed. So maintain agitation. All right, water quality. Said we'd get back to it. It's a really big deal. You have to have a water test. Um, you have to know what's going on with your water source. It's the most important thing. It's the number one resource on your farm. It's the, the guaranteed uh, most biggest impact of any fertilizer or chemical that you will use is water. So know what's going on with it. And, and with foliars or drip irrigation, if you're doing it, uh, everything, you know, you're, you're carrying all this other materials. You've gone to the trouble of deciding what to spray. You've gone to the trouble of buying something that works and is in the right oxidation state. You've gone to the trouble of measuring and mixing. And now you're just going to put it in some sludgy water that just binds it up? No. <laughs> um, so test your water sources. And in a very general sense, if you just get the lamest water test out there, it'll tell you how many grains of total hardness. It will be expressed either in parts per million or grains. Um, and we, we have to keep that under 80 parts per million or five grains of total hardness. If, um, if, if you get a, a better quality water test, then it's going to give you a whole breakdown on you know, sodium and chloride and potassium and calcium and sulfur and um, EC and pH and lots of good stuff. Um, we don't care about, about the potability of, of microbes from, from this perspective. We just care about especially bicarbonates, which is just this hungry little molecule that binds with um, a lot of what we would be putting into a fertilizer tank. And uh, above 120 parts per million of bicarbonates is, I, I would steer you away from even bothering to foliar feed. 
you'll probably get some results, but you'll probably be disappointed. Um, uh, 80 and below, um, I, I would move forth. In between is, is really kind of um, your decision. Ideally, we have almost no bicarbonates or carbonates, although that's it's very rare um, to have carbonates in your water. Um, water changes, especially depending on the on the you know hydrology of your of your well or your pond or your um, of your rivers. Um, but you know you cannot necessarily assume that the water test from four years ago is still accurate. So keep up on it. Um, what can you definitely use rainwater? Collect rainwater. Uh, the, the, nothing could be more um, easy to state and difficult to do, but whatever degree you can, you know, make rainwater your first resource. And when you run out of rainwater, okay, move on. Um, you know, as you're thinking about whole farm planning, think about rainwater catchment. Um, the next best option is, is reverse osmosis, which can be um, wasteful and expensive and only slightly complicated to set up plumbing wise once. Um, and there are lots of options and it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Reverse osmosis really does clean up water sources. It, it strips out the minerals, um, leaving clean material for us to use. Or if you've done a water test and it's okay, you know, I mean, that's my favorite thing is to be able to uh, look at a, a grower's water and say, great, you are good to go. This is okay. Um, structured water we don't know about. There's a lot of variability. Um, it does things. I will say it does things. It usually does not take out bicarbonates and other minerals. It certainly doesn't take them out from a physical point of view. Um, it may make them moot for long enough for your foliar to work. Seems, seems the likely case. Um, that would be all the magnets and um, you know, site, uh, uh, sorry, I can't think of the word, um, swirling water and various mineral, um, tubes that water might pass through. Um, you know, maybe is, is any kind of water source. It might be good, but you're going to have to test it. Um, I will say like on acidified water, um, often you can acidify bicarbonates out of your water. Uh, you can add citric acid or, uh, sulfuric acid or acetic acid and um, and determine how much you have to add to get down to a certain pH. If you get down to a pH of about five, then your water, uh, the bicarbonates will be temporarily satisfied, basically. Uh, the, the acid will throw off a bunch of hydrogen, which will bond with that bicarbonate and allow your foliar materials to slip by. Um, but just through sitting a number of hours, certainly days, um, that acidification will wear off. Atmospheric oxygen will, will interact again, and uh, that water will now have its fully active bicarbonates. Um, softened water is a no. Softened water is, is terrible. It makes water worse from the perspective of foliars. It puts more stuff in it. Um, ditch and stream and well and hard and stored water, you know, generally um, to be avoided. But, you know, you might get lucky. So take a test. Uh, here's a, a reverse osmosis system that I recently saw at a farm um, I'm working with in Wisconsin. Um, you know, just dedicated a, a little um, shed. He had terrible water. Um, I think 200 and some parts per million bicarbonates, lots of other mineral load. Um, and they're feeding dairy cows with that water and um, already seeing benefits on the crops, on the foliar uptake and on the, on the dairy cow health. You know, that's the other thing is that this, raw, this water source is, is for you and your family and the same things apply. Um, hey, Nathan. Yes, sir. There's a, just to, before you move on from the water testing, there's a, a, a question in the chat about, do you have any more information about water tests or sources or can you elaborate a little bit more about, you know, getting your water tested specifically? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, easy answer. Logan Labs, L-O-G-A-N um, in Ohio is uh, great for soil testing um, and has a accurate and inexpensive water test. It's going to be uh, a matter of taking 
a water bottle, just like a you know recyclable, crushable water bottle, filling from your source, whatever it is. If it's a pond, stick well below to about the level where your where your uh, hose is. If it's from a well, make sure that you've either irrigated recently or run the washing machine and, and taken a bath so that you're not getting pipe water. Depending on your pipe material, that can interact. Um, so you want to get the best representative sample of that water, fill up that water bottle completely, squeeze it out about a, a quarter of the water so that the water is still at the very top and there's no oxygen in the bottle. Screw on the, the lid tightly, put that in a couple of <laughs> bags so that it won't uh, won't leak and send that off with, um, uh, go online, request a, uh, a soil sample request form from Logan Labs. And it's about 30 bucks. Um, hopefully that, that handles that. Great, thanks. Cool, and I see that I'm gonna have to move if I want more questions to be available. Um, measuring. Don't don't pass this off to the lackey on the farm. It's super critical. Uh, uh, small amounts make big differences. Do it yourself. Assign a manager. Don't guess. Actually measure. <laughs> it's not that hard. I know it. It uh, especially on um, smaller scales, it, it can be pretty. It can feel ridiculous at times. But uh, just get the equipment necessary to make it um, a, a joy. It's a fun little chemistry experiment. Or if you're a baker, then you might dig it. Um, but do what you need to make this process uh, workable and safe and, and measurable and easily cleaned um, because you also don't want to like dip between containers and uh, you know um, if you're using dry materials you're going to need a scale uh, you're going to need a mask if it's dusty you're going to need an apron if it's fishy right um, don't don't make mixing your foliar the chore of the nasty back shed swarming with flies <laughs> it's because because then you're not going to want to do it um and actually talking with julie rawson recently uh they told me this genius idea of um, they have some pretty standard mixes that they repeat often throughout the season and have a uh, a glass jar or a bucket you could do it on any scale even a even a massive spray tank um, measure once very accurately and mark where the material comes to right so just put a line or a piece of tape that says you know calcium and then measure and put in the the next amount of magnesium and that'll take it up to that line and then you know uh, you can have a pre-marked uh, container for recipes you use frequently that can make it a lot easier for anybody to do you don't have to fumble through paper and, and, and look at recipes um, I think that's uh, that's a really great idea. Also, there are lots of pumps. Um, if you're using liquid materials, um, like the kinds of pumps that you see for snow cones or <laughs> you know big uh, epoxy, if you've ever mixed epoxy, there are a couple of bucks on the internet, and they screw right into the top of various size, you know whatever size the opening on your five gallon or one gallon or two point five gallon container is, and those are awesome because you can buy them that put out one ounce or two ounces or four ounces with a single pump. So all of a sudden you can, you know, shake the container very well and, and have these things already set in there. They have an airlock, so they don't, they don't let oxygen in when you're not using them. It's, it's a revelation. <laughs> um, all right, you know, I have to say, you know, understand the materials, follow the rates, know the MSDS, know the hazards. Um, and you know can obey your your organic management plan and communicate with your certifier um sorry um yes that will do it um so we're gonna we're gonna breeze through here um on the actual equipment but these principles remain the same no matter what for organic materials. If we're not applying, um, you know, herbicides, then lower pressure under 40 PSI is good, especially critically if you're, if you're using foliar inoculants or any kind of compost tea, any living component where you think there's some, um, some bacteria or fungi, their, you know, their cells can be squished basically, busted wide open and killed at high pressures. Um, this is why pressure canners work. 
So you, you, you have to keep the pressure low. Um, lower the better, honestly. And any, any sprayer worth its salt will have a, um, a pressure gauge on it. And most of them are measuring the total pressure after the pump. But some more complicated systems might have different pressures at different points in the system. Hopefully you have multiple, um, you know, multiple gauges, but just keep an eye on that. If you have a way to adjust your, your pressure, uh, keep it low. Um, the higher the water volume, generally, the better. This is perhaps a little different than uh, traditional knowledge, which, which says that you want as, as little as possible at a high pressure to cover the entire leaf on the bottom and on the top and everything, you know, a fogger basically, but that's insecticidal information, right? That's when we're trying to cover everything because of the fallacy of the idea that we could kill everything. With a foliar application, um, we would rather have larger droplets of, um, with more accessibility, even in fewer places, you know, cause a fine mist is going to dry very quickly. And then even if you have excellent coverage, you're not getting it in the plant. It's got to, it's got to be mobile enough to be sucked in. Um, you know, the, the other potential, if it's not from a, from actual plant uptake through the stoma itself is, um, is actually, uh, not osmosis. Oh, I'm forgetting the, uh, technical term, but you know, just actually absorbing in through other leaf tissues, uh, through the cuticle itself. Um, but again, it has to be liquid. So bigger aperture nozzles, bigger droplets. Um, and you know, the, the, the great news there is that you'll have less clogging and it should be easier to use. The nozzles are going to be cheaper. The one downside is you're going to use more water. Um, so, you know, on, on the, on the garden scale, even on the uh, greenhouse scale, on the CSA and um, you know frequent uh, frequent turns of smaller uh, produce um, market garden, um, any of these work uh, just fine, and they're easy, and you can have a whole fleet of them for 15 employees, and it'll cost you you know <laughs> 90 bucks. Um, the uh, the bummer to me is that the hose end sprayer is always a piece of junk. I've never had one last for more than, you know, two or three weeks. I think they're just designed to sell whatever brand of, of product is, is sold in it. Um, but it's awesome because it's a high volume of water. You, you don't have to carry the water. Um, you don't have to leak backpacks or fill, uh, you know, if you have access to a place with a hose. Um, there are some better ones. There are some uh, European manufactured um, hose and sprayers that look um, that look suitable. I've not put my hands on one, but um, especially when not for foliar per se, but for a heavy soaking inoculant. Um, if you're doing a soil primer, if you're trying to get a bacterial inoculant out in your soil, if you're between bed turns and you want to like rot down that that material, it's awesome to be able to really soak in a lot of water. Um, the ubiquitous backpack sprayer, uh, you just have to have one. They're too simple and cheap and effective, no matter the size of your farm. Even if you're a thousand acre grain farm, there is uh, a reason to have a backpack sprayer. Um, any, any matter of, of small trial, um, any matter of, um, <laughs> you know, problem spots. Um, and best of all, you know, they don't make problems. They don't weigh thousands of pounds. They don't have complicated machinery. Um, you can do it in, in wet ground. You can, um, you know, it's just such a low economic and skill threshold. Um, and the, the scale is, is surprising. I managed a, you know, a several acre fruit and vegetable farm with a backpack sprayer and it was never more than a few hours per week. Um, I know people who manage 30 acre fruit farms with nothing but backpack sprayers because it just makes more sense in their situation with, with spacing. And especially if you have trees here and there, if, if you've inherited one of these old orchards where somebody just kind of plopped in, 
mixed trees and you've got to hit the plums in one tank but they're all over and the pears in another tank but they're all over really there are so many practical reasons to um to have backpack sprayers and there's lots of different designs there's gas powered there's electric powered there's hand pump um you know since it is 2020 uh if you're buying one get an electric backpack sprayer <laughs> they're silent and awesome and you, you, your left arm won't be twice the size of your right arm after pumping um then there are uh, a lot of things you can do subtle little things you know it does not have to be the single wand that is always comes with these guys the number one thing absolutely buy yourself whatever size hose barb 50 mesh filter that that fits the hose on your sprayer just cut it stick this dude in then you can see at a glance if how much uh, how much material you might be collecting and you can unscrew it and knock it out while in the field and put it back on instead of um, the dance that usually happens when you have a clogged tip because um, there might be three or four things to, uh, to go through. Um, nicer, more expensive professional units are already going to have multi-stage filtration or at least one filter, but they might be really hard to get to. You have to take it off. You have to fuss with things. Um, the cheap, ubiquitous backpack sprayers usually have no filtration and you need to, uh, this was 11 bucks on Amazon. Um, there are lots of different cone tips, depending, you know, if you're always spraying, two rows walking down the middle of the row then you know put two tips on it so that you can hit both at the same time um uh, lots of uh, you know just feel free to to get creative with these things uh, i also put mine on a backpacking frame an old solid backpacking frame which just makes it a lot more comfortable it's got better straps that way if i'm really doing a marathon session um it it's it's more comfortable um, ATV sprayers, UTV, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, all I need to say here is there's so many manufacturers and there are so many options and it's such a great option, especially for livestock farms. This is, is really a way to go. Um, spraying your pastures after the animals have just gotten off. You know, if you're rotating out of a three quarter acre pasture every day, um, good chance you're already driving your four wheeler out there to move fence. Um, or to, you know, to set up water lines. So just go ahead and have a, have a tank mix. And as soon as your cows are moved, then you can go back over that ground and be super impressed at the, at the, at the turnaround and payback of foliar feeding uh, pastures. It's, it's a big deal. Any kind of, um, and, and you know, you, you can adjust bed spacing for a lot of vegetable and fruit crops uh, to, to use these guys. Um, you can even mount, you know, air blast sprayers. Uh, there are tons of options. And if you have such a device, I would, I would look into it. Um, next step up, right. You get, you know, your small tractor sprayers. These can, could be, uh, you know, trailer hitch. Um, they could be three point hitch. They could be powered uh, through the battery or through their own separate engine or through um, there are even some ground drive um, rigs and, and some that you can hook up to uh, a team of horses. Um, there are just so many of them and you can go pick one up for a couple hundred bucks. It's going to have chemical residues, but, you know, grain farms are getting larger and larger and uh, need newer and better equipment for the new classes of pesticides that they're not allowed to have drift. So they're getting rid of their old sprayers like this, which are still perfectly appropriate for the majority of organic agriculture. Um, so don't let not having a sprayer get in your way. Um, my, my favorite technique um, was, was actually mounting one of these small, uh, you know, 30, 40 gallon tanks in the bucket of our tractor. We, we just uh, put some bolt holes through, did a custom mounting, made our own custom boom arms that could go up um, or lay flat. And it ran off the battery of the tractor and we could adjust the height. So if we were spraying raspberries that are seven feet tall, we could, you know, we could raise the boom. Um, if we were hitting strawberries that were just mere inches off the ground, we would get it way down there. We would have no drift. Um, and Furthermore, you still have the back end of the tractor. You could mow or cultivate or do whatever you're doing. So 
um, I, I, you know, if, if you've got a, a bucket on the front of your small tractor, that's a whole thing that I don't really see people doing, but uh, works great. Um, and then, you know, uh, there, there's, <laughs> there's lots of options for how to get it out. And if you're at this level, then I'm probably not the guy to talk to you about the technical aspects of, of, of boom sprayers and airplanes, but just know that the, all of this equipment works, right? There are so many ways to, to get it done. Um, the tips are, are really important, and there are so many, so many options. A dozen manufacturers, each one has hundreds of options. Just just pick something simple. Basically, you want the largest aperture with the biggest droplet size, and you can usually tell because it's going to have the highest gallons per minute. Um, it's, it's going to have the highest number of fluid flow through. Um, the, you know, uh, T-Jet flood jet is your, your standard old, you know, it's a couple of bucks for a nozzle. Uh, the plastic ones do wear down, and, and you need to pay attention to those nozzles over time. Um, but, you know, you, you can spend a lot of money on a nozzle, but you certainly don't have to. Um, you just do have to make sure it's actually <laughs> spraying. That's critical. Um, I, I like to take the filters out of these guys. They, they often come with filters uh, mounted in, in here or up above here in the, in the body of the, of the line, um, and we avoid it avoid it for reasons I'll um, tell you in a moment. But, you know, again, there's too many options on, on these tips. And um, what I would say is, you know, go buy a few and see what the shape is. And if you like it for your particular application, then go with it. Always have some in reserve. Um, and filtration. All right, Nathan, just five, five minutes, Nathan. All right, all right. Uh, last little bit here. Um, filtration. Uh, even the tiniest particle can blow, that, that should be able to blow right through this fence, right? Sand can blow through, but it still gets caught, right? It still collects. Why is that? That's because you put something in the way and that particle hit and dropped or it just stuck, right? So a lot of people switching over to... Uh, um, Thicker organic materials have troubles with, uh, with filtration because on the one hand, we think we should filter. On the other hand, anytime you filter, something will hit that filter and it will, <laughs> it will clog. Um, often the best option is to have no filtration or certainly no filters in places that are inaccessible or frustrating to get to. Um, the very best option is to filter long before it ever even went into the tank. Uh, filter any material, whether it's your home brewed um, uh, calcium and oyster shell mix, or it's your, uh, you know, uh, EM1 or an inoculant, or, you know, an AEA uh, rejuvenate or sea shield or holofoss. Like, um, filter it before it goes in, and then have usually one 50 mesh filter in line. Um, and and that's about all you need you know from there this is really not rocket science even even very large industrial farms are just using <laughs> you know something like a kitchen strainer is is enough um, if you're sending through drip line those, those apertures are smaller and you do want to actually exclude that material because the pressure is so low it can build up in drip line so if you're using these same ingredients which is almost universally applicable uh, you know have a higher mesh for, for drip line. Um, but remove the filters at the spray tips. Don't over filter. Um, soak your inoculants first, screen before adding, and keep a can of air um, with, with your equipment. If you have a, a, a boom arm sprayer with lots of nozzles, if one clogs up, it's often easy just to take a can of compressed air and squirt upwards and it blasts out, and then it'll probably come out okay um, shortly after. Um, Cool. Sorry, no time for questions, but I will be utterly happy to, to stay on and answer anyone's questions as long as you uh, you like. So there you go. Thanks well, for listening. Thanks, Nathan. There's a there's a couple questions in the chat here. I'll just get to real quick. Um, uh, yes. So should it be applied to underside of the leaves? Sounds like generally that's a yes. For yeah. For um, 
for the dicots, the broad leaves, um, and trees, yes. But do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you, you can spend more time and effort trying to get to the bottom side of the leaf than, um, than the benefit that would be given by doing the same thing again later quickly on the top of the leaf. Um, small steady amounts of foliar fertilizer make a bigger impact than big doses. We can't, there's not enough room in a plant or in a leaf to take up probably even all the fertility we're giving it at tiny, tiny volumes, right? Um, so I would say, yes, if there, if your equipment is set up such that you can do that easily enough, um, great. But if, if it's um, an impediment to spraying, I would much rather see you walk quickly, hitting a little bit on all the leaves or drive quickly or keep the sprayer you have um, and make small changes. But, you know, um, the, the potential uptake by focusing really hard on the bottom of the leaves is, is, is probably moot, all things considered. Even plants, even the dicots still have stoma on the top of their leaves, just fewer. Uh, one other question, uh, your opinion of the DRAM micro fit. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that as a spraying tool. You did talk quite a bit about spraying tools already. Um, that one I'm not particularly, uh, particularly aware of. Micro fit. Let's see. Um, I'll, I'll look it up while we ask another question. If there is uh, other questions from a participants. Uh, just getting some good feedback in the chat. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, some folks have gotten some ACA products and this gave them the information they needed to, to apply it properly. So thank you. All right. Excellent. Um, yeah, the micro fit. Um, I'm not. Um, I was actually. How long do AEA products keep for? Um, so the, you know, the general divide between AEA and and most products, I would say, is the degree to which they are living or inert. Um, the more inert materials, like the rebound micronutrients, um, will last years. The more biologically active materials, like Sea Shield and Sea Stem and rejuvenate, uh, I would recommend to plan for a um, using in, in season, you know, they they do store over winter or uh, for for more than a year. And certainly, you know, um, I've had I've had plenty of folks using materials from two and three years ago and having uh, perfectly good results. The number one thing is that they are all rock mineral suspensions not solutions so there are physical particles which can sink over time and will and the longer it's sat the more vigorously you will need to um, to agitate and to stir those materials back into suspension so with uh, smaller container sizes that's no issue usually a lot of shaking and then some more shaking and then more shaking than you thought um, will will resuspend those those particles and then once you know once you've got it resuspended after winter you're you're good in large drums in 30 and 55 gallon drums um re-agitating is is a process which i will trust you will have equipment to pump out and and re-agitate basically through a, another tank and back into the original container um, but uh, short answer um at least a year <laughs> Great. Uh, how about one more here? Uh, how, where do you get a SAP analysis? Okay. So yeah, SAP analysis is, it can be ordered through AEA if you're, if you're working with AEA um, consulting wise. Otherwise you can buy, anyone can go through Crop Health Labs. That's Crop Health Labs. And they are actually the sort of US purveyor 
and depot for all the sap analysis in the country that goes then to Nova Crop Control in the Netherlands. Uh, there are um, they, they are the most established and by far the most accurate that, that we um, know of in, in our work. But there are also a few options now in the United States, one in Michigan called New Age Labs, and one in, I believe, Oregon called uh, Apical Labs. Great. Um, one more question. Is 200 to 300 micron size considered large droplets? Um, yeah, I guess that would be a medium droplet. I think um, 600 and above would be probably considered large. Um, 300 is, is perfectly, perfectly applicable for everything I was talking about here. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share that uh, QR code in case anybody else needs that or was waiting on it. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. If people do have questions, why don't you just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask Nathan and I'll, um, while I go ahead and share this QR code again. Otherwise, um, if for those that are leaving, Nathan, just thank you so much for taking the time and a very informative presentation. I think you've um, you know, stimulated a lot of, of good thought and questions for, for folks to apply at their own, um, their own farm. So thanks for taking the time. We look hearing, forward to hearing more from you. And for those with questions, sounds like you have a few more minutes. Okay, very cool. Sorry there weren't more jokes or anything. Hope it wasn't, uh, <laughs> wasn't too boring. Nathan, um, I collect water off my roof in a huge hundred plus year old cistern under the ground. Do I need to get that tested? Yes, you need to test your water. Probably. Um, the only issues will be um, whatever might be on your roof uh, or more, more critical, the material that the cistern is made of. So if it's uh, stone with, with mortar, um, there could be various things coming out of the stone, interacting oh, there. It's um, brick with mortar. Okay, brick, brick is pretty inert. I, I do not believe that you will be having much coming out of there. Um, a little bit of calcium, probably. Just a little bit of calcium would be all that's kind of chemically reactive when you put acidic rainwater in there. Oh. Um, but yeah, a lot of cisterns, you know, they, they can be made of different things, even the additives in the concrete. Um, so still worth having tested. But yeah, I mean, uh, la last year, a farm that really had a lot of great results, but never really came together for um, finally switched from using a well to a cistern that was unused in any other way. It just had water flowing through it and being wasted and started using that as their spray water. And really things changed in a hurry a lot a lot of stuff came together cool so. okay thank you you got it and okay well so what can you tell me what freshly acidified water is i don't i don't know what that sure is. so so that that's just a um if you're using something like citric acid uh, or vinegar or any any number of um, conventionally acceptable uh, acidifying agents to well to acidify the water to drop the pH down. Okay. Then um, you know those materials usually would be put through um, some kind of doser, you know, some kind of um, injector, and added at a steady rate as the water goes through. Um, or you can do a whole tank mix, fill up you know that ninety percent of your water. Um, and if you have, you know, if you have a, a pH, a water pH of seven, seven, and that's just all you have, and there's no other option, but you, you know, you really want to be using liquid nutrients in water, then, um, then you're going to need to apply, you know, a fair amount. There, there's no way to tell other than testing, literally standing there with a pH meter, adding some acid, you know, take a gallon or a half gallon, whatever 
add some acid, check the pH, add some acid, check the pH, add some acid, check the pH, until you get to five, 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 six. Um, and uh, you can also use like pool test strips or fish tank test strips. They'll, they'll get you close enough for that initial testing. And then when you think you've got it right, then actually do the, the you know, water, the, the pH test that takes like 10 minutes. Um, okay. But, but if I'm using it the, uh, off my roof that's been stored in the cistern, then that's, um, that's not acidified. That's right. when that, I don't need to... It, it comes by its acidification um, legitimately. And unless there are um, alkaline substances interacting with it, you know, from again, the mortar, the calcium in the mortar um, could, could neutralize that water. But unless you have a high load of calcium or bicarbonates or some other mineral that needs taken out, um, then you, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Okay, that's great. All right. Thank you so much. Sure thing. All right. Well, thank you everybody for sticking with till the end, if you did. And um, I, I hope this was helpful. Have a great evening. Great. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Nathan.